Moscow, the 25th of February, 1986. The Communist Party's 27th Congress begins. State officials have to report on the Union's development since the last Congress and come up with a new strategy for the next five years. The report showed a harsh reality. The USSR was heading towards a total economic collapse. In the 50s, the increase in national income was estimated to be around 10%. In 1985, it barely reached 4%. While the population grew, the economy nosedived, with consumer goods and food becoming more and more scarce. Yet, not everyone had to face such hardships. Empowered by the oligarchic structure of the state, communist elites had access to rare goods, most of them imported from the West, such as clothes and exotic fruits. By handing out these privileges, the Central Committee ensured the compliance and loyalty of its members. The Soviet states was inefficient, slow and corrupt. Something had to be done in order to save the Union. Mikhail Gorbachev, the new Secretary General, came up with a plan. The young, energetic and charismatic leader reinvigorated Soviet society as many saw hope for a better and prosperous future in him. Gorbachev acknowledged the major hiccups of the economic system, yet he considered it to be relatively healthy and in need of a little Ускорение. or acceleration. This involved a greater focus on technological innovation and scientific research, an increase in productivity with the aim to double the GDP in the following 15 years, a gradual shift from fossil-based fuels to nuclear energy. Gorbachev stated that in the following five years, nuclear power plants with double the output of those already operational will be built all over the USSR. Although the plan saw massive public support, it wasn't more than wishful thinking. The so-called increase in productivity implied that engineers, planners and construction workers had to face almost impossible demands in order to satisfy party quotas. If such demands were unmet, the people in charge of the plant and its construction risk being demoted and sometimes even put on trial. This, coupled with the limited funds provided, forced them to cut corners, such as leaving behind parts of the structure, relying on old but cheap equipment and hiring unqualified personnel. Furthermore, scientific progress was not solely driven by the need for innovation. The main factor that influenced it seemed to be cost-effectiveness. The USSR did not have the engineering, scientific and material resources of the United States, so it had to compensate by directing research towards cheaper options, often at the price of other factors, such as safety. A good example for this was the new RBMK nuclear reactor. RBMK reactors produced around a thousand megawatts of energy twice as much as the old VVVR reactors, while also being cheaper. Instead of using enriched uranium-235 as fuel, they would mostly rely on natural uranium-238, which was less expensive, but much more unstable. Most importantly, RBMK reactors could be built on the spot from prefabricated components, a great number of which being produced in unspecialized factories, thus lacking the precise calibration needed for the nuclear industry. This meant that these nuclear reactors were sometimes very hard to control and prone to technical failures. Moreover, many RBMK reactor plants lacked the concrete structures designed to keep radiation at bay in the case of a reactor being damaged. However, this did not stop it from being endorsed by the system. By 1982, more than half of all nuclear energy produced in the Soviet power plants came from RBMK reactors. They were being built on a massive scale. Millions of rubles had already been invested into their construction and the reputation of leaders was at stake. 
Anatoly Alexandropov, head of the Academy of Sciences of the Soviet Union, stated that RBMK reactors were so safe that one could be put in the middle of the Red Square without any risk of contamination. Alexandropov and his institute fueled the creation of the reactor, so they benefited greatly from its success. Acknowledging any flaws would mean acknowledging a scientific defeat, and the party could not allow that. In fact, the propaganda machine in the Soviet Union was so convoluted that leaders started believing their own eyes. Even at the time of imminent economic collapse, the leaders of the CCCP still blindly pushed for maintaining the USSR's aura of greatness. Socialist progress had to be seen as flawless, so most accidents were continuously dismissed and swept under the rug. Gorbachev's was slowed down by the same impediments that had been poisoning the Soviet system for decades. This first idea of progress would soon come at an extremely high price. In the summer of 1970, construction for a new RBMK nuclear power plant began. It would be built in northwestern Ukraine, 100 km north of Kiev and 16 km south from the border with Belarus. By 1986, the plan would house four fully operational RBMK nuclear reactors, with a fifth on the way. It would be the third RBMK nuclear power plant in the USSR and certainly a perfect example of the achievements of the Uskarini. Borrowing the name from the nearby town of Chernobyl, only 16.5 kilometers away, it would be known as the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. Unfortunately, its birth and upbringing had been troublesome to say the least. Director of the plant, Viktor Brukhanov, had been under constant pressure from local party officials since the start of construction. They saw the plant as a means to boast to the Central Committee about their achievements. At the same time, construction workers started becoming more and more impatient with their pay. Men were plenty, but materials were few, so they had to use whatever equipment was available. The prefabricated components that had been given to them were very low quality in some cases and would consequently cause multiple malfunctions in the future. There was also a significant lack of qualified personnel. While the average percentage for the completion of construction for a nuclear power plant was around, well, 90%, for Chernobyl it was only 68%. All of this, together with the cheap design of the RBMK reactors, made the power plant increasingly unreliable. Safety played a secondary role, while meeting party deadlines was a top priority. Surprisingly, the power plant would prove to be one of the best in the industry, with an average of only 5 accidents and malfunctions per year. In 1985, the plant surpassed production quotas by 10%, mostly by reducing the time assigned to repairs. Outside the power plant lay the prosperous town of Pripyat. It was a so-called Atomgrad, meant only to house plant workers and their families. But its population quickly boomed. In 1986, it reached 50,000 residents, most of them young and unmarried. The average age of the resident was 26, and each year 1,000 babies were born. Because of its proximity to the nuclear power plant, the city had close ties to the military-industrial complex, which brought a lot of benefits. Goods and food considered rare in most big cities were accessible in Pripyat. The town had two stadiums, one normal swimming pool and one Olympic swimming pool. Brukhanov himself admitted to funding some construction projects in the city. As local authorities lacked the money for their ambitious plans, they often relied on the support of Brukhanov who found himself redirecting funds and resources from the power plant to the city. Most of the city's population knew very little about nuclear energy and believed the state's narrative about the friendly atom and the absolute safety of Soviet nuclear reactors. 
The chief engineer of the Chernobyl power plant, Nikolai Fomin, assured the public that the plant's cooling basin was so safe it could be used for fishing. This was taken too seriously, however, as plant workers and other personnel began fishing in the basin at night. Huge thing! No, hold up, hold up. Now I'll sit. Unfortunately for the people of Pripyat, their trust in the state would soon be utterly shattered. On the 24th of April, 1986, Chernobyl's Reactor 4 was scheduled to undergo a routine test. It involved checking different systems at low radioactivity levels. Last minute, a special request came from Donetsk, where researchers wanted to figure out whether, in the event of a power failure, the plant's still spinning turbines could produce enough electricity to keep the water pumps running until the emergency generators kick in. The whole procedure was supposed to begin at around 10 pm when the reactor shutdown was scheduled, and finished at 1 p.m. the next day. However, the shutdown was delayed until the next morning, on the 25th. Then it was delayed again, for 2 in the afternoon. Just 20 minutes before the reactor was supposed to shut down, a phone call came from the Kiev electrical network. Apparently, a power plant from the Mykolaiv region ceased to function unexpectedly, so they needed Chernobyl to remain operational until the evening. While waiting for the approval to come, the power of reactor 4 had to be cut in half, from 3200 to 1600 megawatts. They finally got a green light from Kiev at around 9pm, and scheduled a shutdown an hour later. By now, the less experienced night shift was on the job. They did not receive proper instructions on how to complete the maintenance test, let alone the additional steam turbine test. So they resorted to calling Anatoly Dyatlov, the deputy chief engineer at the power plant. Dyatlov was the top nuclear scientist at the facility. <coughs> Difficult and often very harsh, he was known for his stubbornness constantly undermining the opinions of both his superiors and subordinates. Still, he was especially efficient at his job, so plant management endorsed him. There was even talk of Dyatlov soon replacing Fomin and becoming the new chief engineer of the power plant. Everything was looking great for Dyatlov, so he had no reason to hurry on the night of the test. He took the usual 45-minute walk from his apartment to the power plant thinking that it would just be a usual day at work. The testing procedure did not concern him, as he saw the situation to be completely under control. On his way to reactor 4, he took a short detour in order to rectify some misbehavior he had witnessed around reactor 3. Furthermore, due to the previous delay, the team of engineers from Donetsk, whose job was to test the steam turbine, found themselves running late. This gave Dyatlov a good reason to take his time. When he entered the control room of Reactor 4, it was already past 11 pm. In the meantime, operators continued to reduce the energy levels of the reactor, reaching 760 megawatts at 12 am. Now, the even less experienced morning shift had to complete the test. The leader of the group, Alexander Akimov, was a 35 year old engineer with just 10 years of experience at Chernobyl. He would often be described as competent, yet easily affected by the pressure coming from his superiors. Leonid Toptonov, the senior reactor control chief engineer, was in a similar situation. The 25-year-old had been working at Chernobyl for only 3 months at that point, making him one of the less experienced workers around. The operators of the morning shift thought the experiment had already finished by midnight. Now, unprepared and under great stress, they had to complete the test themselves. Dyatlov did not help them in any way. He continuously urged Akimov and his men to hurry, accusing him of intentionally stalling the procedure. 
Confused by the incomplete plan he was given and constantly bombarded with harsh remarks from Dyatlov, Akimov found himself barely capable of managing the situation. Initially, all was going well. However, as Topunov was inserting the control rods into the core, an emergency indicator signaled that the water reserve of the reactor was unexpectedly low. Yuri Trehub, the leader of the prior shift, who remained in the control room to witness the test firsthand, jumped to help Topunov and opened the water pump. Suddenly, the power levels of the reactor started dropping insanely fast. Moreover, a malfunction with the automatic control rod mechanism caused an even greater dip in reactivity. 28 minutes past midnight, the Reactor 4 computer registered only 30 megawatts of power. Unknowingly, Topunov caused a decline while operating the control rods. Panicked, he started chaotically pulling out the rods, which prompted Trehub to intervene. Eventually, they managed to stabilize the power at around 200 megawatts. Dyatlov, who was not present when the reactor plummeted, now urged them to continue raising power. Then, apparently, Dyatlov and Akimov agreed to continue the test at the current power level. It is not known whether Akimov or Dyatlov came first with the idea, but this decision would prove fatal for Reactor 4. 105 AM they activate both reserve pumps. The influx of water drowned the core and slowed down the reaction. At that point, the reactor had been running at low power levels for far too long, thus emitting xenon-135 in the control rods. This basically poisoned the core by absorbing neutrons. 14 minutes later, they shut down the pumps as part of the testing procedure. At 1.22 am, the control panel's computer system indicated an increase in radioactivity. The water from the cooling system started to boil, thus transforming into steam. Less water and more steam meant higher radioactivity, as there was nothing to cool the reaction anymore. One minute and four seconds later, the steam turbine test started. It lasted only 36 seconds, but during those 36 seconds, the reactor went nuts. Power levels were rising uncontrollably, and Tapdunov started to panic, shouting for help. According to Dyatlov, he was 10 meters away from Topdunov and did not hear his call. Instead, Akimov hurried and ordered Topdunov to press the AZ-5 button. Leonid did just that. All 178 control rods were lowered into the core, thus stopping the reaction. Everyone in the control room breathed a sigh of relief. The test had been completed and the catastrophe had been avoided. The only problem now was explaining to their superiors what had happened that night, that night, that night, 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 night.